Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I welcome you all to this next, next lecture in the course Development Process and Social Movements in India. Today's lecture is designed around the notion of regional development. In this lecture, we will try to figure out that how the issue of regional development has been discussed in the Indian context, how this idea has evolved in the pre-independence time, during the independence movement, after immediately after the independence movement and how in the subsequent decades this idea of regional development intermingled with the planning and the idea of political mobilization has gained currency. It will be pertinent for us to understand this notion of regional development within the coordinates of economic modernization process in India which became eventually the project of the modern nation state in India. It also needs to be understood under the lens of the idea of globalization, idea of industrialization in India and overall the process of economic development and growth along with social sector development. This lecture will have certain components including the planning as a process for regional development, issues on contentions regarding regional development since 1950s and thus we need to focus on not only the notion of economic development as it was envisaged in 1950s through the planning, but also we need to figure out that how different ideological positions or different perspectives regarding the development has been contention and has been debated around the regional development. When we think of and try to figure out that what is this regional development and politics has to do with this course and why we need to figure out that how regional development is directly linked to the idea of politics. For this, we need to have an overview of this whole interlinkages between the regional development and political processes. Since various changes have taken place in Indian politics, it may be a difficult task to trace all these changes. And thus, if one makes an attempt to list some of those changes, one may have to travel from state to state to figure out salient changes in the politics of different states. Now it is very important to first understand that when we talk about the idea of region and regional development, here we are actually trying to figure out that how the conception of India as a geographical entity along with socio-economic and political entity has been organized around different regions within India. Thus, as we already hear about and very often discuss that the idea of India has something to do with many Indias living within India. When we say that there are many Indias or many Indias within India, we are actually trying to figure out that how different regions in India have not only separate geographical zones in terms of hilly regions or coastal regions or mainlands or central India, but also we are talk talking and discussing and trying to figure out that how this conception of varied India within India has something to do with the cultural affiliations, the economic affiliations and socio-political developments in different parts of India. If we bring all these together, we find that different parts of India have different regional identities and those regional identities are not only limited in terms of their geographical terrain or in terms of only their cultural terrain. These regions have long historical processes of development in terms of socio-economic as well as political. And these are the developments which together constitutes what we call as the regional identities. These regional identities over a period of time have grown to the extent that we now started discussing and have talking about the regional imbalances within the conception of larger process of what we call 
as democratic processes or development processes in India. In this whole processes, we also talk about the different contestations regarding this idea of regional imbalances or regional identities. If we try to figure out the similarities or the distinctions between different regions, we need to go through all the provinces of India or the states of India in order to figure out the similarities and the differences. It would be difficult to do justice even with that since within states there are distinct patterns of regional politics. Within one state, the politics in one region could be very different from the other. Now, there is this complexities of understanding politics and the political processes in India when it comes to understanding even one particular state. If we identify one particular state with one particular region and then try to make sense of that how politics unfolds in that region, then we will interestingly find that that particular state may have multiple regions existing within. For instance, if I take the example of Uttar Pradesh, we find that the political nature or the political character of the Eastern UP is fundamentally different from the Western UP. Similarly, if you go into the Bundelkhand region of Uttar Pradesh, again you find that the distinctness of the geographical training, distinctness of the culture, distinctness of the language completely shapes the economic outcome of that region as well as the political aspirations. And thus, at least three distinct kinds of political environment, three distinct kinds of economic, socio, cultural environment exist within one state that is Uttar Pradesh. And that is one example to showcase that how the complexities of understanding the political processes in India in terms of regional differences comes into picture. We will keep these regional differences and the complexities of this whole process of regional dis differences in mind while trying to make sense of this whole process. To start with, we need to keep this in mind that independent India's commitment to democratic politics meant that its polity had to grapple with the harsh reality of India's poverty. The sheer number of the poor who were also now voters, the intensity of poverty and destitution and a deeply stratified and hierarchical society. Now, as I have mentioned, that to once you start making sense of the regional imbalances and regional diversities and understanding the political processes in these regional distinctness, you will find that there are multiple issues one need to start with. And when we start this understanding immediately after the independent movement and the freedom struggle, and once India got the independence, then you find that the harsh reality of India's poverty, the sheer number of the poor who were now the voters in 1951, the intensity of poverty and destitution as it was at that point of time and a deeply stratified and hierarchical society in terms of differences in the society due to caste and religious distinctions. It was because of this kind of issues that the whole framework of regional and regional diversities and regional development was understood in 1950s and early 1960s in a completely different manner. If you compare that understanding with understanding of regional development in 1970s and 80s, we find that there is a huge difference. If we look into this idea of regional development and origin and its contestations, we find that development, no matter how one defines, it brings disparity, though its scale and nature could be varied. A broader historical overview that maps progress in living standards is imperative to understand the development discourse. Now, here it is very important to make sense of this whole idea or discourse of development within the conception of region. The foremost thing which is very important in terms of understanding development in the context of region is the no idea of disparity. No matter how justified we are trying to do, how much justice we want to do with this idea or notion of development, we always will come across the conception of 
disparities in the process of development. And it is this disparity which is inherent in the process of development which brings in or highlights the problem of regional. It depends on who defines it and for whom, as Jonathan Crush in Power of Development, his book talked about. Here it precisely means that what Jonathan Crush is trying to underline is that when it comes to understanding the very basic conception of development and then the development of a particular region, then it is important to also understand that who is bringing that definition or understanding of development on board. What are the vested interests through which the particular understanding or idea of development has been promoted or projected. Now, uh, here I will put a note of caution that when I am talking about this notion or conception of development and linking it to the whole process of what we call as regional imbalance or regional development, then I must clarify that this concep conception of development I will problematize in little later in my presentation while I will discuss that how this notion of development was contested and put forward in a particular at a particular juncture in the history of India's development story. If you look into this origin of the concept of development, we all know that this what we call as development or growth in the modern sense, it was laid down in the western societies in 19th century, late 19th century and early 20th century. And thus one can say that the whole conception of development is precisely a Eurocentric concept. When we say that a particular concept here development is a concept, it precisely means that the very basic characteristic of or the notion and understanding of process of development is basically thrown by or put forward by the countries in Europe in a particular setting and with a particular reference point. For those at that point of time, the particular reference point in terms of development was capitalism and thus the notion or idea of development as it emerged in 19th century Europe and early 20th century Europe, it was precisely based or grounded in the fundamental notion of market based economic growth. Till recent past, significant emphasis on the capitalist growth form of growth or the growth of national income was the core basis of understanding or putting forward the idea of development in the context of regions. More so, the idea of development has acquired different meanings to different pe people in the larger run. You, we find that any discussions bound to generate either of the three when it comes to understanding the conception of development or when we discuss the conception of development or we simply raise this question that what do you mean by development in a general setting then you find that there will always be some kind of debate around the conception of development and thus development of what development for whom and development for what all these kinds of question will always be there and contested the second important thing which will emerge in the conception of development will be around the notion of contradictions. So, whenever you talk about or put forward the idea of development, you will always have this notion whether development should be pro people or whether development should be pro economy, whether development should be pro ecology or whether development should be pro extraction of raw materials and thus that contradiction is always inherent within the modern discourse of what we call as development. Similarly, the third aspect of understanding development is in terms of the notion of conflict. When we talk about the conception of development, it always induces certain kinds of conflict. That conflict could be between two different human societies, it could be between Adivasis and others, it could be between different genders, it could be between the nature and human beings or it could be between two diff different ecological settings and thus development has this inherent part that is called what we call as the conflict understanding of development. If we go into this whole framework of idea of development as it evolved 
and as we discuss and talk about in the contemporary society then we need to keep it at the back of our mind that this conception of grant gained currency in the post second world war this idea became all pervasive in the west immediately after the second world war and it almost became synonymous with the process of what we call as modernization and industrialization now i'll spend a couple of minute on these two conceptions that is modernization and industrialization in order to link it to the idea of development the moment we see that a society is developing or if we ask this question that what are the parameters of a developed society how do you say that a particular society or a country is developed the general response the common sensical response or the knee jerk response to this question will always be in the form of following two that well that country is modern or has modernized its infrastructure and second that com that country or that region has industrialized its setting it means what that on the one hand a society needs to have certain infrastructures in terms of modernization it should have broad good roads it should have electricity available it should have proper water connections and also of modern amenities needs to be there in terms of pakka houses as well as schooling systems etc this is one aspect of what we call as the modernization process of any society along with these amenities it's important to understand that the process of modernization has a particular political setting and that is of liberal capitalist economic system thus a society is modern if along with these amenities it is part of the larger liberal political democratic order in addition it should also have the capitalist model of market based economic system these three together constitutes what we call as the modernization process of development in addition to that another important aspect of process of modernization is or process of development is industrialization so this is now an, another precondition for a society to be modern or to be developed that it needs to have industrialization it precisely means that society needs to distance itself from the within core traditional method of subsistence that is agriculture so any society based on agriculture product is not supposed to be developed these are some of the cliched understanding of framework within which the process of development has been understood and explained to us for very long this became the basis of classification of developed developing and underdeveloped countries and regions in 1950s and 60s we all know that this conception of what we call as modernization and industrialization has over a period of time contributed significantly in terms of figuring out that how different countries or different regions of this globe has been placed within this paradigm of development we look it carefully on the terminologies which developed over a period of time along the ideas of modernization and industrialization in post second world war we find that if there are set of countries in europe and america and those who have the designation of developed countries it precisely means that they are modernized and industrialized and they are completely integrated into the market capitalist economy on the other hand if you look into the another sets of countries who were dependent upon the modern developed countries but were trying to follow and catch up with the modernization project or the industrialization project of the west then those countries were termed as developing countries india can be taken as one example of developing countries on the other hand you have all those countries who are lacking behind in terms of both modernizations and industrializations their societies are still lacking in terms of the process of education in the terms of process of modern amenities and in terms of all the availabilities of resources which needs to be there for being qualified as developing or developed and in that context you find 
that the countries in Africa, some of the countries in Latin America, they were considered as underdeveloped countries. So, you have total of three sets of countries emerging in 1950s and 60s, the developed, developing and the underdeveloped. The same understanding or framework of making sense of the geography of any development concept was used to make sense of the development process within countries too. And thus, if you examine this whole process of development within India in 1950s and 60s, you find that the same three distinctions that is developed, developing and underdeveloped can be used for explaining that how certain regions of India were developed in 1960s and 70s in terms of modernization and industrialization. A few examples could be what we presently call as Kolkata, Madras or Chennai and Bombay or Mumbai. On the other hand, you have certain developing regions in the country. So, you have smaller cities like Ahmedabad and others which can be considered as developing. On the other hand, in the same way in 60s, 50s and 60s, you have smaller regions or village sites or the rural India where you can use the term underdeveloped to figure out that how the smaller regions of Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, the present day Jharkhand, Orissa, they were relegated to the notion of what we call as development. And thus, overall, this whole understanding of developed, developing and underdeveloped can be easily placed in terms of regional imbalance in any particular setting. Economic growth, social justice tensions, they were some of the fundamental problems at the time of Indians. And it was in that context that the whole debate about the regional balance and imbalance started taking shape. Coming to the understanding of planning in post-independent India. Now, here we have to keep in, in mind that because of this available discourse of development, modernization and industrialization as it was imported from the West immediately after the independence movement, that India had the very intense debate that which model of development India needs to adopt. We had the available Gandhian model of development, we had the available Marxist Leninist framework of making sense of on the socialist pattern of society and also the Bombay plan kind of alternative or availability which strongly stood for the capitalist market based economic development. Under the leadership of Nehru, we had this very intense debate and finally, the country decided to have some kind of mixed economic system. But before that, we will try to figure out that how that movement from the intense debate to settling to this idea that we will have mixed economy went into. In the post independent stage, the idea of development India was built on the Nehruvian concept of modernization. The, here we need to settle down with the fact that of course, post independent India in 50s and 60s, the conception of development or the regional development was largely driven by the fundamental idea of modernization as it was envisaged by Nehru. It was based on technological advancements and industrializations as discussed earlier. Including, we also had this concept what we call as development planning. The concept, it is single, universal, rational strategy of a state to promote development of the nation. Now, this development planning as single, universal and rational strategy of the state became the core project of the modern state immediately after the independence or during the during the Nehruvian phase of India's development. It precisely means that there was a sense of making sense of development and economic growth and that one singular principle or idea of develop was implemented across all the regions of India to argue that it is only through the heavy industrialization and economic growth that any region which is lacking in the growth trajectory can catch up with the rest of India.
the country, uh, rest of the regions. The Lewis model of planning in which the capital good and consumer good distinctions were made and the emphasis was given on the capital good in order to ensure that whole lot of employment can be generated and a huge population can be shifted or the labor force can be shifted from the agriculture sector to the industrial sector. And it was around this whole framework that the notion or model of development was introduced. In addition, the traditional sectors culture were always put on the back burner or was never given considerations. On the other hand, the modern sector that is industrialization became the top priority on only basis for ensuring the development in different regions of India. And modernization and industrialization became the synonyms with the regional development. Moving to the 1950s and 1960s and linking it to planning and regional development, we find that independent India began its journey under the rubric of mixed economy. The years between 1952 and 1992 are normally cut into following three different periods. The first period was what we call as ad hoc period of economic planning and development. This was the phase or stage in the India's economic development where there was a lot of tentativeness in terms of which plan and which model of economic growth will be implemented and will be experimented with. And it was at that point of time that India was taking its time to consider whether it should go for one plan for all the regions or diverse plans for diverse regions. Ultimately, we find that in the second stage, that is the period of initiations between 1956 and 1967, that India decided to go for one plan for all the regions. And it was during this phase that the dominant framework of development was designed around the idea of modernization and around the idea of industrialization. After this pre of initiation, which gives some hope that yes, the problems of poverty, the problems of backwardness, problem of social inequalities and economic inequalities can be addressed through industrialization that in the third phase, the period of consolidated planning between 1968 and 1991, that almost blindly the Indian state went on for modernization and industrialization, only way to achieve growth and economic development in all the regions of India. And it was interestingly the same phase during which most of the crisis in terms of economic, social and political also exist. and thus one may get into the research and try to figure out that how on the one hand the confidence of the state that it can iron out all the problems or all the differences in the society in the form of economic, political or social organization and industrialization and on the other hand during the same phase the society is suffering from economic, political and social crisis. Moving to the idea of regional development which emerged out of this whole issue of planning and development during three phases, we find that regional development by 1960s and 70s was interpreted differently in the different contexts. The only convergence was at a point where regional development dealt with the process at the special scale. Eventually, the idea of development, the shift in approach from the Keynesian to neoliberal that we find that interesting input state coming up. So, from 1950s to 1970s or 80s, you find a particular kind of understanding of regional development was figured out. That particular understanding of regional development till 1980s was largely driven by what we call as Keynesian economic system, which precisely means that a system or a market capitalist economic system within which the role of the state is considered as very important. In a Keynesian economy, the state is supposed to take care of or bear the burden of housing, education, health, etc. And it is through this, these taking share in the burden 
of common people in these three sectors that it is supposed that people will be able to save money and they will then go to the market and buy things and that's how the demand will be generated and that's how the economy will grow in contrast to this model of development which was practiced in india till 1980s in 90 early 1980s and early 1990s a new economic model was introduced which was fundamentally different from the keynesian economy and that was the neoliberal economic system within which the role of the market suddenly became very important and the core argument was that the state must withdraw and must shun its responsibility in terms of any kind of intervention into the market or into the health education sectors it was precisely on those ground that a new economic model of regional development came into picture i will discuss and talk about this in de little detail in a while while talking about scjs and the regional development shift also in terms of broadening the traditional focus on the economic to encompass the social and the ecological we will also see that how once this idea of economic development of different regions based on keynesian economy started failing that the shift towards new liberal economic development based regional growth was envisaged that the traditional focus on the economic also shifted to new sectors that is the social and the ecological growth or development and thus one can say that this whole idea or notion of regional development had a broader phase now or a broader is a broader understanding of it in the form of what we call as ecological development and social development if we look into the planning for the notion or option of regional development as I, as i talked about in the previous slide in the historical context then we find that this whole idea of regional development had certain framework or understanding the colonial administration that was the pre independence phase in the pre independence phase the whole framework of understanding regional development was precisely guided by the idea of exploitation of the available in a particular region and thus you will find that there is no direct link between the kind of in infrastructure which were developed at that point of time in the certain pockets and the actual economic growth or the idea of modernization and development in those regions in fact there was a inverse relationship between the development of infrastructure in a particular region and the kind of economic growth or development which took place for instance if you look into the availability of railways or the way railways expanded in late 19th and early 20th century in north india you will find that across all those states where railways expanded its infrastructure in bihar or in assam all those states actually offered because of the availability of those infrastructures all those states lagged behind in terms of their economic in late 19th and early 20th century most of the famine took place in those regions only and thus one can safely say that there was a inverse relationship between the infrastructure growth and the economic growth in any particular region in during the british colonial period moving to the congress intervention in this whole understanding of regional development in india during the independence movement we find that it was nehru's interventions and his understanding which guided and shaped the whole framework of development of different regions in india if we look into the haripura congress of 1938 and both in his pres presidential speech advise or give the advice of planning commission at that point of time thus one can say that even before reaching to the final independence in 1947 almost 10 years before that the very idea or the framework of development or in modernization in india finalized and laid down in the haripura congress and immediately after that 
when the formation of National Planning Committee under the chairmanship of Nehru was laid down in 1938. And it was precisely the model of development and growth which was borrowed from the Soviet Russia at that point of time, which was undergoing huge transformation through the process of planning. If we look into the debate on regional development in 1970s onwards, then you find that the debate began acceptance that the process of development does not start at the same point of time and that means that some regions are behind in the process. Now this is very important to understand here that whenever you go through any debate on the regional development and the nature of regional development you find that the is not necessarily starting at the same point of time in all the regions. Precisely for this reason that there are different regions, geographical regions in any country who are lacking behind in terms of development and there are others who are not necessarily lacking and they are taking advantage of this time lag. If you go through the writings of August Loesch, Gunnar Mirdal, and Frankius Perox, you find that there are different debates or conceptions about the development, different geographical regions, the polit politics of development in those regions and how history has played important role in the different in development. Similarly, if you look into the debate on regional development, you also find that the political regions in the form of ideological inclinations or issue of preference again become very important in terms of shaping and guiding the whole framework of development. Within the Indian context, you find that the states like Kerala have a different developmental paradigm or discourse. If you compare the same region with say Bihar or Uttar Pradesh, you will find that the whole development discourse is completely different and the core of it is in terms of the nature or the political inclination in these states. If there are states who are more guided by their identity politics, by their caste politics, then you will find that the whole framework of development is completely different. Similarly, moving to the reasons for this non-uniformity, you can count the natural conditions also at times responsible. So if you have coastal regions, you find that they may be have more developed economic infrastructures and, and the economic growth is higher in comparison to the lands which are not necessarily around the coastal regions. Similarly, historically created differentiations that lead to comparative advantage based on resource endowment. And here again, history plays very significant role in terms of shaping and guiding the framework of development in different regions. Coming to India's understanding of regional development and how at certain point of time, certain instances or certain incidents or certain initiatives by the state contributed significantly in terms of not only regional development on the one side, but also looking at the same issue from the different perspective or from the other side of the fence, one can say that it contributed to regional imbalances. And one classic example of this kind of contradictory emergence is in the form of Green Revolution. In 1960s, when this whole idea of green revolution was introduced, there was a certain backdrop to it and it was in the form of potential of industrial development being exhausted in different regions in India. We all know that when in 1947 India got its independence, it was basically a poor country, underdeveloped country and it, the largely the workforce was in the informal sector and in the agriculture sector. And it was under the Nehru's vision that the series of industrialization projects and processes, more so about the heavy industrialization, started taking shape. This whole framework or understanding of development with industrialization was almost exhausted by 1960s. And again, the crisis started emanating because there was a limit to the industrialization process and the availability of workforce because of the lack in education, literacy, etc. It was at that moment that the new conception of green revolution was introduced. In addition, the problem of 
land redistribution was still persisting. Thus, within agriculture sector also, the crisis was continuing. Wherever the land re redistribution took place, even that did not contribute in either industrialization of that region or shifting the workforce from the agriculture to industrial sector or contributing in any kind of huge growth in within agriculture sector. In this context, when the green revolution was introduced, it ultimately led to huge growth in certain regions of the country in the agriculture sector. In 1960s, when the new hybrid variety of wheat crops were introduced in Punjab, Haryana, Western Uttar Pradesh and certain sugarcane varieties were introduced in Maharashtra and some other part of India, suddenly we find that the trajectory of growth within agriculture sector went up. Interestingly, it contributed in terms of new dynamics in the regions within the states and we find that western UP as a region, a new region of agriculture growth and development emerged. Similarly, Punjab and Haryana in North India, Maharashtra, part of Maharashtra in western India part of Gujarat in Western India, all these emerged as the new centers of development and growth, engine of growth, mainly starting culture growth, but eventually contributing in terms of industrial growth. And it was in that situation and that circumstances, then we had regional development taking place in India in 1960s and 70s. Interestingly, it is also the same phase where the regional imbalance and regional deprivation also started factoring in and contributing in regional imbalances. The target of doubling the farmer's income, advanced rural employment, adding to the regional, but do keep in the mind that while the target of doubling the farmer's income and advancement of rural employment is contributing in the regional growth, it is also contributing at the same point of time relative undergrowth of the other regions and for instance, if on the one hand the western UP was growing because of green revolution, the relative deprivation of the eastern UP highlighted the problems of regional imbalance. Similarly, Bihar suffered during this whole process of economic and agricultural growth in 1960s and 70s. Now, if we put this regional development and economic crisis within the larger context, we find that regional development and planning has found its significance renewed as the global scenario comes by the rising inequality resulting in local economic insecurity compounded by new global threats through unregulated markets and climate change. Here now we have to keep in mind that if during the green revolution and after that we find that the regional growth also contributed in regional imbalance, then by 1980s and early 1990s, we had the third phase of understanding the whole problem of regional growth, regional imbalance and development and that was in the form of the emerging economic crisis in the overall capitalism across and it was during this phase only when the Keynesian economy was challenged and the neoliberal economy through the neoconservative politics like Thatcher and Reagan were propounded in 1980s. It was through the lens of neoliberal economic growth paradigm that once you start analyzing the problem of India's regional imbalance, you come across certain problems of insecurities, economic insecurities shaping and guiding the regional imbalance. Themes such as underdevelopment, uneven development and globalization, regional and planning in the middle of changing and challenging context of 1980s. If you look into the available literature of economic growth and regional politics and regional development in the 1980s, more so on those literatures which contribute in terms of understanding the politics of Asian countries or India in specific, then you find that these terms like underdevelopment or uneven development or growth and globalization became 
very useful in explaining and making sense of, of India. And it was in that context that when the economic crisis was there, the crisis in capitalism was there, that major economic measures were taken by India in order to address the new challenges of regional imbalance and regional depravity. The year 1991 remained a watershed in the economic history of India when open economy format was adopted, that is what we call as liberalization, privatization and globalization, that all these three were introduced in, in India in 1991. It opened the gate for global competition and it also opened the gate for possibility of private investment in all the regions across India. If 1980s, the inefficient management of Indian economy led to financial crisis, it was in the late 1980s and the realization also loomed that this is now the time to switch from the state-led growth to market-led growth. And it was inherent within this framework of market growth that the re regional imbalance can be taken care of or can be addressed. The regional dimension import is important to address specific kinds of deprivation at different sites of exclusions like dams, highways, special economic zones, industrial sites, etc. World Bank and IMF immediately rushed to help India with offering of $7 billion of loan, but with a specific conditions that more competitive environment through privatization and liberal liberalization did at that point of time. And it was at that point of time that India immediately went into opening the economy and providing the private players all sorts of situations to have economic growth through investment. A new chapter of growth in India in terms of regional imbalance to debate on planning in India and its barrier to economic growth was questioned and it was debated that how if India has to move on the path of economic growth and development then it will have to address the problem of regional imbalance. India cannot afford to have huge pockets or regions in India lacking in terms of development and growth but on the other hand they are doing well in only in certain pockets or certain states and regions. It was in that context that the planning and development in the emerging scenarios came out with the solution of dealing with the regional imbalances through new conception of regional development and planning and now the issue of environmental sustainability, technological innovations and the consequences of spatial restructuring were considered within the planning paradigm of regional development in India. And that is how you find that the issue of ecological crisis in states like Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh or issue of huge dams being constructed in Northeast or in Himachal or Dehradun or Uttarakhand, all of them were discussed and debated in depth. Development and planning debate is still a huge issue among the researchers and policy makers in terms of making sense how to go for development of a new kind where not only the economic growth as a fundamental of regional development can be addressed but also the sustainable development which can address the issue of social development, human development and ecological development can also be taken care of. It was in that context that we need to also keep at the back of the mind that while on the one hand all those considerations took place while designing the modalities of development in different regions in the post 1991 era, but on the other side the, unfortunately there are also the practices like special economic zones which were brought into application for addressing the issue of regional imbalances. SCJ as we all know are the geographies within a nation states or the regions within the nation states with a distinct legal framework which provides for more liberal economic policies and governance arrangement than prevail in the country at large. And they are the regions which are 
precisely developed and given the special designations in order to attract large volumes of investment by providing following three. One, world class infrastructural facilities in a particular region, a favorable taxation regime and incentives for sectoral clustering. It was in that benefits of increased employment in the region and faster economic growth was proposed. Now, if you look into this whole working of special economic zones in India since 1995-96 onwards, you find this model was largely borrowed from Chinese economic growth model where SCGs worked in favor of the economic growth in that particular country. But in context of India, as we know that different regions of course have different kind of advantages and disadvantages. Unfortunately, it happened so that the initial decades of economic liberal and privatization, the SEJs were allotted to those regions only where already the economic growth was advanced. The availability of infrastructure, availability of electricity, availability of ports, all those are important considerations for developing SEJs. As a result of this framework or this understanding of allocating SEJs to those regions, that it eventually contributes in the growth of those regions which were already advanced or they were doing well and thus it not necessarily translated into the desired result of growth of those economic regions or those regions where they were working. Thus, you seldom find any SEJ in Chhattisgarh or Jharkhand or any other uh, small states where the economic growth is lacking. Regional development is now necessarily linked to these economic clusters and hubs coming up in different uh, states. Unfortunately, this for very long till recent past that the SEJ can contribute to regional growth, but not necessarily allocated to those uh, states where actually it was much needed. If we look into the regional development in terms of Indian model, you find that some of the key findings in terms of figuring out this Indian model of regional development or how India has addressed this issue of regional development in its own context, then you find that one important aspect of it is in the form of what we call as private sector at the forefront. So, it is always more so post-1991 that the private sector is trying to figure out that what is this idea and the notion of regional imbalance and how it can be erased or eradicated. And it is in this context that you find that different models of growth including what we call as the Chandababu Naidu's model of growth to what we call as Gujarat model of growth or what we now recently started listening about the UP model of growth, the different models of growth are emerging which are trying to address the issue of regional imbalance through private players. In this whole exercise, the states and central governments are supposed to play the role of facilitators and nothing more. And it is in this context that those private players are supposed to contact the governments and these governments are inviting the private players to invest in their respective states and respective regions so that they can also join the issue of growth and development in their regions. One of the main problem of Indian model of growth or the regional development is as I have already discussed the problem of location of SEJs in areas which are already highly developed and thus those regions which are not so developed they are still waiting for SEJs to be allocated and thus the economic growth to be introduced. For long time there was neglect for farm sectors and poor rural and thus that has also contributed in the larger economic regional imbalance because the rural sectors and the agriculture sector were neglected in the post independent era. Still lopsided development of regions because of the dominant based on industrial development which the driving force is still for many states and thus many states in political leadership think that they can only introduce and ensure the notion and framework of development through the economic growth.
recent changes in terms of ecological awareness introduce that in the recent changes in terms of ecological awareness has made some of the states aware of the fact that they cannot afford to ignore the limits of ecological uh, exploitations and thus they have to keep in mind that the sustainable holistic growth can be ensured in the regions. The recent example is of the nature of landslide in Uttarakhand and some of the problems which are emerging in Himachal Pradesh due to construction of high dams that how those regions which are ecologically sensitive that the kind of economic growth we are trying to push on those regions whether they will be able to sustain and have the growth in that region. If we go for the assessment of the regional development in India, we find that the causes of regional imbalances in the form of historical, locational advantages and failure of planning, then you find that all of these reasons need to be understood alongside rather than picking one or the other and just seeing the causes of regional imbalance in the country. Second important aspect of understanding the lack of regional development or the problem of regional development in India is in terms of political leadership. For a very long period of time, the lack of vision and motivation to address the bank politics thing which harmed different in the country. And the best example is in this, in this context is of Bihar, where you see that how the vote bank politics or the politics of division and caste has negatively contributed in the whole problem project of development of the whole region. Similarly, the third important aspect of understanding or assessing the pro regional development is in terms of political instability, the problem of corruption. And thus you find that despite the fact that the regional aspirations were addressed by creation of states like Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand, then too in the last 20 years or so, these states have failed to contribute significantly in terms of addressing their regional imbalances and the problem of poverty and social insecurities. It is precisely because of the either corruption or political stability that these states have not been able to contribute significantly in the growth model of India. The interstate and intrastate disparities are still continuing. Those disparities are at times in the level of policy making or those disparities are in terms of the cultural understanding of different region then planning economic growth accordingly. The spatial distribution of industries are still lacking, they are still lopsided. There is no uniform spread of industrial growth across India. Still we have pockets in Tamil Nadu, certain Parastra, certain pockets in Uttar Pradesh where the industries are located and rest of the countries are still backward or rural. We need to bring balance to that. In, similarly, urbanization and migration needs to be addressed, then only we will be able to make sense of this regional imbalance and how it can be addressed so that we can have proper economic growth. And with this, I will end my lecture and I am sharing a few important readings with you and you may go through all of these readings so that you will have more in-depth understanding of this issue of regional imbalance in India. Thank you.